You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil and I'm here with Jeff and Matt today. Matt, I'll start with you. How are you today? I'm doing great. I had a great experience at a uh, local high school production yesterday. Oh, yeah. Uh, you went to uh, Colleen's uh, production of Chicago at uh, Riverside Brookfield High School. So thanks for coming, you and Jane. Uh, and Jeff, uh, how are you doing? You you and uh, Angie came as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely loved it. It was a great performance. Uh, Colleen killed it on her her first go. It was the best live production of Chicago I've ever seen. Oh, good. Well, well, definitely, definitely top one of one. So. <laughs> well, she'll appreciate that. If anyone uh, in the crop came, uh, I know she posted in there, you asked for her to post uh, last production. Uh, thank you for coming. If we didn't see you, uh, sorry, we weren't, we weren't able to. We were up in the balcony. Uh, like, uh, in our uh, ivory tower. Yeah, like Waldorf <laughs> and Statler. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. And Ken isn't here, unfortunately, today. He was so inspired uh, by the show that he wants to become a razzle dazzle lawyer like Billy Flynn. So he's uh, taking the LSAT right now with no training. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Usually goes well, I imagine. Yeah, it, I, it worked okay for Leo and Catch Me If You Can. That's true. It did. He just said uh, he was a doctor. He said, I concur, I concur. And then he watched, I think it was Perry Mason, uh, and just learned how to become a lawyer. And he passed the bar. Uh, but yeah, and Ken also is working on a, a new uh, type of trivia game that we're calling Trivialidol, uh, like Wordle. But it's just triviality questions that we've gotten wrong, which is plentiful. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought it was just triviality questions that are really boring. Yeah. It could be that too. Very dull. Which is most of the ones we've written. Yes, but <laughs> but speaking of uh, questions that aren't boring. Uh, and that we, we have, haven't written. <laughs> that we haven't written. We have a, a very special guest contestant and guest host today. Uh, we'll start with our guest contestant. Um, she uh, has a little connection to where we're recording right now. We'll let her talk about that. But she's an Oakland Five uh, supporter on Patreon, which we appreciate. Coming to us from Maryland, that is Liz Olson. How are you, Liz? Hi, I'm doing well. Um yeah, I uh, grew up in the same town that you guys mm. are recording in or live in. Um, and about 10 years ago, almost to the day, I moved out east. So I'm, I've been in Maryland for a while now. But um, I think you mentioned on one of your shows that you were recording in LaGrange Park. And I like paused it, I rewound it, and I was like, did they just say <laughs> LaGrange Park? It's it's very small geographically, not population wise, but geographically. You were that Leo very small, meme pointing so. at the TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? And what are you doing out in Maryland other than hearing, I'm sure, countless uh, references to Marvel every day? Oh, yeah, that I hear lots of. Um, I, I work for the federal government, actually. Oh, wow. So I am, yeah. Mm. Uh, not at liberty to discuss any uh, further. Yes. <laughs> Classified, redacted, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for joining us uh, and for uh, reaching out to be on the show. We appreciate it. Uh, in order to have a game, uh, Liz is going to need a partner first. So she's going to partner with Jeff. And I believe you came up with a team name based on what Liz is drinking right now. Yeah, I believe we're going to be uh, Afternoon Guinness. Mm-hmm. Afternoon Guinness. All right. And Matt and I, uh, Matt came up with a team name for us that uh, I thought uh, worked really well. Uh, it's pretty simple. What is it, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah. Just Based off, you know, headlines I've seen on all the news apps, uh, we're going to be, Neil wrote a book, the book's coming out soon, we need to buy the book, and please pre-order the book. Yeah, so being Patrick Swayze, Essential Teachings from the Master of Mullet, uh, simple team name here. So, um, <laughs> But uh, to play the game, we need uh, a host, and w- with this LaGrange Park local connection, uh, who better than uh, the busiest uh, trivia 
worker person in all of the trivia lands. Uh, just one of very our favorite succinct name. I know. Yeah, just very long. Uh, one of those desks. What do you call them? Like um, the name plates. Like the Good plates, person yeah. at trivia writing. Busiest person, person in trivia, uh, as 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 we like to say. But uh, yeah, so excited to have Jay Borsum here, uh, rules guy impersonator on Patreon. Uh, our old friend and uh, just uh, the, the the best person around. So Jay, how are you? I'm I'm good. It's been a year already, huh? I, oh, it has been. You're right. I didn't even think about that. It has been a year. Yeah, I got this running mechanic with you guys where apparently I'm just on like once every calendar. Well, it's year. your yearly I checkup, this is... like the doctor. <laughs> oh, why would I just turned 41? Why would you remind me of how, what checkups? <laughs> like? What now? What have you been up to? We know that there's a uh, a brand new venture uh, that you're a part of that's really really cool, and we'd love for you to talk about that. And then obviously any other um, streams and things people can check Liquid out. Liquid courage. <laughs> there it is. Um, yeah, keeping the online stuff going two years into the pandemic on Twitch. Uh, starting to break back into live venues in the Chicagoland area, hopefully beyond at some point. So if you know a venue and you want to host trivia and you don't want to be bothered with writing it or coming up with a concept, call me, text me, page me. People still have pagers, right? It's 2022. They're back, yeah. Um, That's true. The 90s are but back. But beyond that, the, the big thing that I've uh, built in the last couple months is my version of something like a Learned League or a BP Trivia or some of the other like web-based trivia formats out there. It is the World Trivia Federation, which was absolutely named so that the initials could spell WTF because I am secretly 12. <laughs> and what... And that goes out uh, about twice a week right now. Eventually, it's going to be three times a week. It's a 10-question quiz, uh, currently just managed through Google Forms. And then I do all the grading and scoring through Google Sheets, uh, post a leaderboard. We use a rating system as opposed to you know specific matchmaking and, and divvying people up into uh, different categories based on their skill. So you always have the opportunity to kind of move up or down the leaderboard. It's it's finding its legs. Yeah, my favorite thing was somebody asked, uh, how do you prevent cheating? And you said something along the lines of there's no prize and we, you know, who cares more or less? <laughs> yeah, I think my gut shot response was, well, how does anybody yeah. prevent cheating? We don't. We just ask you not to yeah, suck. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't cheat. It's the honor system. Yeah. And we know we have a lot of listeners. How could you have fun like that? <laughs> I know. Well, some they just have very dark souls and lives, I guess, uh, yeah. who cheat. Um, but we know that uh, many of our listeners play uh, Learned League or at least have talked about it. And you told me a couple differences, like you just mentioned, that I thought was nice uh, and had me interested, which is the rankings are different. And it's just answering questions. You just want to answer questions, have fun, and, and there's no like extra stress on top of it. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the big one of the big things I wanted to address that I've never really loved about the idea of, for instance, a Learned League is the concept of a forfeit. Uh, I, I figure it should be more opt-in than opt-out to participate. So I kind of built the system around you can passively participate whenever you want to, uh, as opposed to being you know set in a match that you have to do at a certain day at a certain time against a certain opponent. Uh, if you need to take a couple of weeks off or you're not you know feeling a particular quiz, just don't do it. I mean, there's a nominal penalty if you're one of the highest rated players for skipping a quiz, but it's really, really nominal. Awesome. Well, well, we're so happy that uh, you started that and uh, we're excited to hopefully have a bunch of people in the crop uh, and our listeners join um, to play some great trivia, but we have to play some great trivia today. So let's, uh, let's throw it to the rules guy and uh, see what we're going to get today. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. Cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. Was that another member of Bowling for Soup, Matt? <laughs> Secretly, they're all members of Bowling for Soup. Chris Hansen, Gilbert Godfrey. Yeah, I, I would love to hear 1985 in Gilbert Godfrey's voice. <laughs> I, you may be the only one. I think for like $100, we could make that happen. <laughs> we probably we probably could. Just send send them the lyrics. Uh well, Jay, uh, I mean, he did he did a WAP cover for free. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, well, that's true. So maybe <laughs> maybe we will. Maybe we'll send the 1985 lyrics. Uh, Jay, feel free to take it away. Uh, didn't mean for that to rhyme, but uh, we are ready to play. <laughs> that rhymed too. All right. So um, the really good news is I have a bunch of questions prepared for this game. Uh, the really bad news is I didn't prepare an entire round for this game. Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, and the questions that I prepared are all former questions from previous quizzes in the World Trivia Federation. So to kind of mix things up a little bit, I'm going to have you as the teams in each round just randomly select a quiz and a question number from that quiz. And I'm just going to present that question to you. Okay. 
So I figure uh, afternoon, Guinness, we'll start with you calling out the shots for the first uh, round. Neil wrote a book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can call the shots for the second round. Uh, I have a swing round ready to go. I do not have a final round. And that is by design because one of the things I've been doing on my uh, streams recently is a concept called speed run trivia, where I take uh, as much time as necessary to write 20 questions from whole cloth based on uh, viewer suggestions. My current record is just under 40 minutes to write a 20 question game that we present on the back half of that quiz. So I figured it'd be kind of interesting if we emulate that for the final round today. So what I'm going to need from all four of you uh, before we start is a keyword or a category. And during this game, I'm going to write a question that references that keyword or fits in that category. Uh, so we're going to do this very on the fly. Liz, I'm going to start with you. Give me a keyword or a category. Uh, I don't know. Disney. I knew it would be Disney. 100%. Yeah, I, I kind of did Disney. too. <laughs> the only thing I'm good at. No, right, how about you, true. Jeff? Uh, okay, for, uh, for sticking on theme and things I'm good at. Um, it also plays into Neil because I'm not assuming you're going to go the way I want it to. We're going to go magic. Ooh. It's not magic. an illusion. I can work with that. Uh, let's move it over to Neil and see what you say. I suppose uh, because the the book's coming out, I'll just uh, be on the nose and and uh, predictable, and I'll say Spielberg. Yeah, that's Swayze. Yeah, literally Swayze. I was already typing Patrick Swayze. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt, what do you think? Um, I think I'm missing baseball this time of year with the lockout, so I'm going to go with greed. <laughs> Ooh, the the Fox game. Hot, hot takes. So that gets us to four questions. Uh, I need a fifth, so I reached out privately yesterday to Ken, and I'm going to open the email he sent me right now. This is the big like Oscar reveal of the envelope, <laughs> and it looks like the keyword that he suggested is... Japan. Ocarina. Oh, Ooh. Okay. He's been playing Majora's Mask, uh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for this convoluted setup, Jay. I look forward to playing this game. So good news, you have a heads up on what the final five categories are going to be. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the actual meat and bones of the game, start round number one. Uh, afternoon, Guinness, I don't know how you guys want to uh, delineate it, but what I need from you for question one is a pair of numbers from one to ten. They can be the same number. It is your choice. Do you want to pick thir three and seven? Because sure. they're both prime and together they yeah, make why, a prime. Why don't you just nice. go back and forth? She'll pick the first one, you go, and then yeah. let's go back and forth. All right, so that's going to be quiz number three. Question seven, and the category for that one is fashion. Here it is. What material was premiered as part of the World of Tomorrow at the World's Fair in New York in 1939, advertised as being derived from, quote, coal, water, and air, as opposed to a comparable Japanese-imported material, which due to geopolitical tensions at the time, helped it sell 4,000 pairs of a particular type of garment on the first day it was commercially available. All right, so I wrote down a uh, an answer. You wrote down an answer. It, it's the same answer, so I guess we should just go with it. <laughs> I think that that's a great idea. Okay, Liz, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, for newer materials, my, f my first inclination was maybe like nylon. Oh, yeah, maybe I was thinking that the Japanese material, the only Japanese material I can think of is silk. Okay. But I feel like that's probably older, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, of some of that would be manufactured. Um, that could also be a garment made into some kind of garment. And I know, you know, nylon is a newer material. So do I just kind of go with that? That's That works for me. Okay, we'll guess nylon. That's a great answer. We didn't even think of that one. We wrote down spandex, elastic, and ultimately went with Velcro. Okay, so we've got nylon and Velcro. Points are going to Afternoon Guinness on this one. Nice job. That was the invention by DuPont of nylon. All right, so I'm ready to move on if y'all are. We are. All right, we're taking it in turns, right? So you're going to get a pick from me. I will go with the classic 42, so four and two. All right, so that's quiz four. Question number two, the category for this one is food and drink. Oh, and you picked a good one. This is one of my favorites. Uh, while it's known by other terms as well, what name for the tasty offering that residents of Rhode Island may call a cabinet can be found as the title of a 2003 song that peaked at number three on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart? Liz, what do you know about this? Anything? You're a little bit geographically closer to Rhode Island than we I are. So. I've been to Rhode Island. Um, one up on me. But... No, I'm, I was trying to come at it from the sawn angle. 
because I'm probably more likely to know the song than. Okay, so so f- we're thinking food related song titles. Is that what we're looking for? Food related song titles. All I can think <laughs> of is the "Give me pizza." No. P-R-G-G-A. Is that because Don't Liz stop is here? Until you hit this <laughs> I I'm completely lost. Well, milkshake is a legit song. So that you is wanna, a legit song. Lock in milkshake, I'm okay. I'm we're, okay we're... locking in an actual song. <laughs> So we're gonna lock in milkshake. Oh, I think they're right. I think they're right too. We we just kept getting focused on candy. I couldn't candy stop shop. thinking about Mandy Moore. I know. Yeah, you were you were drawing Mandy Moore singing candy. <laughs> oh, I thought Mandy Moore candy was earlier. It though. is earlier, but we locked in with candy anyway. Mm-hmm. Missing you, Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not by much. I think that song came out right around two thousand, maybe ninety nine. Uh, but points going to Afternoon Guinness again mm-hmm. on this one. It is. It's a milkshake. Yes. Yeah, the theory, uh, from what I could tell, is that in that New England, Rhode Island accent, the the word carbonate kind of comes out as cabinet, ah. and it's been kind of mutated over the years to be cabinet. Ah, uh, okay. Rhode Island, known for weird drinks, like I think coffee milk is their state beverage. Yeah, and I'm sure like an egg cream is similar. It's got the carbonation in mm-hmm. there, so I'm sure it's all in the same family. Yeah, oyster shakes, whatever else mm-hmm. they drink out they there. They were in Boston. The milkshake would bring all the boys to the yard. <laughs> Hobbit Yacht, more specifically. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Liz, we'll throw to you for question three. Give me a pair of numbers, if you would. Um, one and nine. So quiz one, question nine. The category for this one was language. What word pertaining to something sailors should avoid, Dutch for grinding stream, was first popularized by Edgar Allan Poe in the title of an 1841 short story, and from 1988 to 2014 could be found as the title of an attraction at Epcot in Walt Disney World. I think I might know it. Oh, wonderful. I was hoping with the potential Disney tie-in, <laughs> you would have it. Do you have any idea on this one? No. I'm just trying to think of the Edgar Allan Poe angle. I mean, you have um, Telltale Heart, which is not that. I'm just trying to think the Pit and the Pendulum. Um, I, well, I think something that sailors should avoid. Mm-hmm. Uh do you think this is a pirate thing? Possibly. Sea madness would be something. Sea madness. I was thinking siren initially. But... I also thought siren for very obvious conglomerate reasons. Yeah. You want to just say siren for no reason? Sure. I, I don't think I can come up with anything else. Yep. Siren okay. it is. Um, so Epcot stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. And it is Future World and the World Showcase. And in Norway, they used to have a ride called Maelstrom, but it closed in 2014 and became frozen. Oh. So I locked in Maelstrom. I, that's awesome. Yeah, it sure did close in 2014 and become frozen. Points again to Afternoon Guinness. The Dutch word is Maelstrom. We are getting crushed. We are getting crushed. Just like the uh, the pit in the pendulum. Mm-hmm. Let's keep the beating continued. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go 81. Don't know why, but... Uh, we might get Neil wrote a book on the board on this one. The category is film. <laughs> Let's hope. Hope so. Uh, despite four Academy Award wins across a significant number of nominations across their sixty-year-plus career, what Hollywood great only ever appeared in an Oscars award ceremony once? That appearance was in 1974 and was as a presenter of an honorary award to friend Lawrence Weingarten while wearing gardening attire and clogs. Okay, we can lock in. Wow. My brain immediately said, it, like, there's only a few people who've won, like, won four acting awards, so it's probably someone who's, like, a composer or a director. Yeah, I was trying to think of maybe directors that just didn't go to Academy Awards. Um, I don't know. Do you want to just go Coppola? Sure. Okay, cool. It's better than anything I'm coming up with. Not a bad guess. All right, so they went with Coppola, and uh, which is a good guess. Uh, but usually, when you think of four Oscar wins over a career, uh, you think of a performer, and someone who didn't really show up to the performances uh, and to the telecasts was Catherine Hepburn. So we went with Catherine Hepburn. No way. All right, so one of you is correct. You picked a couple of Hollywood legends there, Coppola, and uh, which Hepburn did you say specifically, Neil? Catherine. And yeah, points going to Neil and Matt on this one. It is Katherine Hepburn who won four Oscars, all for Best Actress, which I believe is the most of any actor to date, uh, and only showed up the Oscars once, and it wasn't even to accept one of those awards. She was kind of notoriously anti-award ceremony until she was asked by uh, her friend to 
present an award in 1974, and she dressed for the occasion. All right, so let's move in. Uh, Liz, your turn to throw a question number at me. Um, Two and four. All right, quiz two. Question number four. The category is the arts. What talented playwright slash composer slash actor slash singer slash director claimed in his autobiography that he wrote one of his most popular works, the 1941 play Bly the Spirit, in only five days? Now, it should be noted that despite jokes to the effect, there is no evidence that he was actually afraid of the Christmas holidays. Oh, boy. I don't know. I mean, the only playwright that even comes to mind is Tennessee Williams. I was trying to think of like any puns or jokes about being afraid of Christmas. Yeah, who would be afraid of Christmas? I don't know. That was... Uh, shall we uh, just say Tennessee Williams since... Yeah, that's okay. fine. I think that's about as good as anything I'm going to come up with. Yeah, I was having trouble on this one. I, I think I was maybe focusing too much on American playwrights. Uh, our official answer is Tennessee Williams, but I think the clue hit me uh, at the end here when uh, when uh, we had to try to think of someone who was afraid of Christmas. And I think there's a British playwright whose last name is Coward, which would fit the clue. But we unfortunately locked in with Tennessee Williams. Uh, Should have pulled that thread a little tougher uh, there, Neil. No points on this one. Tennessee Williams, a good guess, but... Uh, yeah, the joke is that he is afraid of Christmas because he's a Noel coward. Noel coward. coward. He was, uh, one of his last appearances was in the 1969 Italian job. That's right. Mm, nice. Yeah. He was like in the prison, like the uh, prison warden or something like that. Yeah, oh, no he was kidding. in a ton okay, of stuff. remember that, yeah. Uh, well, looks like after five questions, uh, we are still getting beat down over here at <laughs> Neil wrote a book, you should buy it. Uh, we only have 10 <laughs> points, and it uh, looks like uh, Afternoon Guinness has 30 points, so let's uh, let the torture continue. All right, we'll move over to Jeff to pick a uh, question for number six. Uh, well, six and nine. Nice. Oh, I wanted to pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so quiz six, question nine. The category uh, dips back into fashion, and that's going to happen in a random game like this. Uh, with a logo consisting of the brand's initials skewed slightly to the left in a thin serif font with the second letter in lowercase, what California-based fashion retailer founded in 1972 got its start as a surfboard brand, which makes sense considering the location made by reversing the order of the two words in its name. All right, so we were mentally shopping around a on trying to find this brand, and we're not 100% sure. But we did lock in with an answer, so we are, we are all locked in here. I'm not great with fashion, Liz. Do you have any thoughts on this one? The only like two word fashion brands that I can think of are like Louis Vuitton. Yes. And like that's, it's not that. No. Do you want to go American Eagle? I'm fine with it. Okay. I, I don't know where that, I don't know where the base would be for starting maybe in California with surfing, but we'll go American Eagle. All right, Matt, you picked uh, your favorite company of all time. Uh, yeah. And American Eagle is definitely capital than lowercase so that sounds right um but i went with a company that's definitely california based started in the 70s as a surf sailor type company and we went with von dutch i think that's the third dutch reference in this half already <laughs> uh real real close on that idea matt unfortunately no points to anybody the uh retailer in question here is ocean pacific oh ocean pacific uh that was the one i couldn't think of yeah they are OP in the fashion world. I remember hanging out uh, at PacSun, just like, what shirt am I going to buy with my Dickie shorts? Got to rock them Dickies. Um, we haven't done five yet as the first number, so 51. All right, that is a question in the category of politics. Due exclusively to his birth surname, what figure, whose more familiar name comes from his stepfather, is the only king to ever hold the office of President of the United States. The name by which he is remembered today was formalized when he was 22, but had been his de facto name since the age of three when his mother remarried. Uh, Liz, we can lock in. So they're locked in. I The only reason I think I have an inline on this and Matt agrees is I want to say I wrote just a question like in the same ballpark and I almost forgot it. But then as we were looking at each other, uh, Matt jogged my memory because you wrote down Reagan, but I was like, no, it's not Reagan. But then I was going backwards mm -hmm. and it's very close. And I believe it's uh, Gerald Ford. So that's what we're going to lock in with. Yeah. Um, born with the last name King. Um, we agree. We said Gerald Ford. 
Yeah, and points around. I think it's the first time in this half. Uh, right. Gerald Ford born Leslie Lynch King Jr. is one of only two U.S. presidents uh, that you know better by an assumed name than their birth name, unless you count like nicknames for their first name, like Jimmy Carter. The other one being Bill Clinton, who was born William Jefferson Blythe the third, I believe. Ford always makes me think of Dana Carvey. Gerald Ford died today. I remember that so much. Eaten by a pack of wolves. All right, moving into question eight. Jeff, the number pick goes to you. Uh, let's go uh, nine to five. Ah, I'm working that one. What a way to make a living. Uh, of course, Jeff would somehow stumble into a question in the category of geography. Hell yeah. Upon Arizona's admission to the Union in February of 1912, the lower 48 states were complete. What U.S. state just barely missed being able to call themselves the youngest state in the lower 48, having been admitted to statehood just over a month earlier? Matt uh, wrote down an answer that I feel pretty good about knowing nothing about geography, uh, and we'll lock in. I feel like I remember it not being next to Arizona, because I remember, like, my brain wants to say New Mexico because it's right next to it, but... Um, I know one of the other later ones was Oklahoma, but... I think it was I think it was literally just filling in that area with New Mexico and then Arizona. So I I'd like to go with New Mexico. Okay, that works for me. Um, you know, we were in the same boat. We always know that Arizona, I feel like that comes up quite a bit. And I remember hearing I think it's New Mexico. So we just said New Mexico. New Mexico is correct. Nice job. Ooh, wow. wow. Yep, New Mexico, state number 47, admitted to the Union like January 1912. Only five states have been admitted since the turn of the 21st century, Alaska and Hawaii, uh, Arizona and New Mexico. And then the uh, oldest of them is Oklahoma, which is admitted right around 1906, 1907. I forget the exact date offhand, but just a couple years sooner. All right, question number nine. Uh, throw a couple numbers at me if you would, Liz. 72. All right, quiz seven. Question two, the category is sports. Hooray. A race car driver who, among other career achievements, can boast five consecutive NASCAR Cup Series championships and a head coach who can tout a pair of consecutive Super Bowl victories are at least phonetically known by what full shared name? Yeah, we'll say, uh, I guess we'll say John Madden. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I was working back, and I thought, how about them Patriots? How about them Broncos? But then I got how to, about how about them Cowboys? Cowboys? And we got to Jimmy Johnson. Oh, yep. Yep, points going to Neil wrote a book on this one. Jimmy Johnson, spelled I-E, uh, one of the greatest NASCAR drivers of at least the 21st century, if not of all time. And Jimmy Johnson with a Y, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, winning a pair of consecutive Super Bowls in uh, the early 90s, the 1992 and 1993 seasons specifically. All right, question 10 to end the first half. We'll throw it to Jeff to throw the numbers at me. Let's see. Uh, 104. All right, so quiz 10. Question four category on this one is politics again. What animal, part of the rodent family, even though its name evokes an ungulate, is frequently used by groups such as the Free State Project to symbolize libertarianism in the United States, much the way the donkey and elephant symbolize the Democratic and Republican parties? While the official symbol of the Libertarian Party is the Statue of Liberty, this animal is considered representative of the political philosophy because of its defensive tactics and non-aggressive nature. Ron Swanson should be the symbol of the Libertarian Party, but Matt wrote down a guess, and uh, we'll lock in. I really want it to be the honey badger. I, but it's... Mm. I swear to you that I was like, oh man, I want it to be a honey badger so bad. Um... <laughs> honey badger don't care. <laughs> Um, I actually think I know it. Um, okay. So I'm thinking it's a porcupine. They're prickly oh. and that's mostly for defense. So, uh, we were thinking of defensive animals, uh, the opossum, the armadillo, Lawrence Taylor, but we ended up going with the armadillo. Uh, good guesses. I will tell you that when uh, this went out as part of the World Trivia Federation, a number of players misinterpreted my clue in the best way and went hedgehog because that certainly evokes an ungulate as well. But the answer is porcupine and points to Afternoon mm. Guinness. Uh, porcupines getting their name from the roots for pig and spiky. Yeah. 
Wow, good good guess over there. Um, yeah, it looks like after ten questions, uh, we're a little bit closer to catching uh, afternoon Guinness. But over here at Neil bought a book. You should buy it. It's called Being Patrick Swayze: Essential Teachings from the Master of the Mall. We have forty <laughs> written points. written by Neil E. Fisher. Written by Neil E. Fisher, author, podcaster, director. <laughs> we only have forty points, uh, but afternoon Guinness has sixty going into the swing round. So, what is our Swing round category, Jay. So the swing round category for this episode is something I've done at a pub trivia uh, theme round before. It's the second time I'm attempting the concept. It's called the alphabet game. Uh, I'm going to give you a series of 10 clues to trivia style answers. But the big concession here is that all 10 correct answers when combined will yield the English alphabet. All 26 letters used exactly once each. All right, so let's give you those 10 clues uh, for the alphabet game. Number one, the most common abbreviation for a particular edition of a book first commissioned in 1604 and published in 1611. Number two, last name shared by a sitting U.S. senator, an explosive hit single performer, and an Oscar-winning actress. Number three, term for a type of retail store found on military bases, or by inserting a number, the home exercise regimen created by Tony Horton in 2005. Number four, the most commonly played word in North American Scrabble tournaments, which means the vital force that is inherent in all things. Number five, 2001 film starring Mackay Pfeiffer, Julia Stiles, and Josh Hartnett based on a commonly adapted literary work. Number six, word that precedes Cooper in the name of a title character in a series of PlayStation video games from the early 2000s. Number seven, shared last name of television siblings Simon and River, only seen for 14 episodes and a movie. Number eight, airport code for the second busiest airport in the U.S. in terms of passenger boardings in 2020, with over 18 million passengers served. Number nine, substance that was added to Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act in March of 2000. And number 10, unit of typographical measure equal to half the point size of the typeface, such as eight points in a 16-point font. Okay, we will look over these and be right back. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga, Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. All right, after the swing round, we have all of our answers locked in. And just to take a quick moment, we want to thank Liz and Jay for being Patreon supporters. They help us uh, continue to grow the show. If you'd like to join them and get some extra audio content, uh, some perks like posters and boxes and stickers and extra things like that, you can go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. You'll hear a monthly crop drop, a monthly Patreon bonus, uh, and uh, get access to any sort of events that uh, we're going to try and plan when things start to open up a little bit more. But we couldn't uh, do the show without all of your support. So please uh, join Liz and Jay at patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. All right. So again, the premise was the alphabet game. Uh, correct answer set will use every letter of the alphabet exactly once, which I didn't want to give you this uh, teaser going in. means these answers are often going to be very short. Mm -hmm. you know two Pick three letters on, on we, average we did figure that one out it just kind of has to be that way uh number one the clue was the most common abbreviation for a particular edition of a book first commissioned in 1604 and published in 1611 uh we'll start with afternoon guinness what did you come up with um we said kjv so king james bible version all right and neil wrote a book we uh, had a similar idea, King James Bible, so we just went simple and said KJB. Oh, so close, and I think that's going to affect you on the back end. Uh, five points afternoon, Guinness. That is KJV or King James Version. Uh, number two, last name shared by a sitting U.S. senator, an explosive hit single performer, and an Oscar-winning actress. Uh, Neil wrote a book. What did you come up with? 
Uh, we're thinking it was Ted, Teo, and Penelope. We went with Cruz. Yeah, realized that uh, he is dynamite, uh, Teo Cruz, um, but we figured it out uh, just based on the letters we had left at the time. We said Cruz. Yeah, points around on that one. And as Matt pointed out, it is Ted, Teo with the song uh, Dynamite, and Penelope Cruz, who offhand, I don't recall what she won the Oscar for, maybe uh Neil can help me out on that. Uh, yeah, it was for um, a uh, Pedro Almodovar movie. I'm trying to remember now. Um, Thank you, Christina Barcelona. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, it was. I think was it was. It? Yes! Or that was Woody Allen, but yes, I think it was <laughs> nice. Christina Barcelona. All right, number three. I was looking for the term for a type of retail store found on military bases or by inserting a number, the home exercise regimen created by Tony Horton in 2005. We'll throw it to Afternoon Guinness. Um, we said PX, or for the number, it would be P90X in the middle. Okay, and Neil wrote a book. As a former uh, user of P90X for a very short amount of time, uh, we also said PX. <laughs> it was P2X for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, five points apiece. They're often known by a couple other names, uh, Canteen and Base Exchange, or BX are uh, in the mix, but PX or Post Exchange was the one that fit both halves. Number four, the most commonly played word in North American Scrabble tournaments, which means the vital force that is inherent in all things. Uh, Neil and Matt, what did you think? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to say this word. I think it's pronounced like chi, but I'm not sure, but we went with QI. Yep. Um, I get called bull on a lot every time I play this, um, and we put chi, QI. Yeah, it's it's a 10 plus point play every time you do it uh, and you don't have to wait for a U to come up with it, which is why it's the most commonly played word in North American Scrabble tournaments. It is Chi spelled Q-I as an accepted variant form of the typically uh, Latinized C-H-I. Right, number five, 2001 film starring Mackay Pfeiffer, Julia Stiles and Josh Hartnett based on a commonly adapted literary work. We'll throw it afternoon Guinness. Um, it's based on Othello and it's O. Yep, Liz was all over that. <laughs> We also went big Julia Stiles fan. <laughs> we also went with O. Yeah, I feel like there was a, a period in Julia Stiles' career where all she did was modern retellings of like classic Shakespearean works, and one of them is O. Uh, nice job all around. So we're getting the swing of this. Uh, number six word that precedes C Cooper in the name of a title character in a series of PlayStation video games from the early two thousands. Uh, Neil wrote a book. We'll start with you. I was a big fan of the series. I believe that's Sly Cooper. Yeah, not sure if he was part of the Family Stone, but we too said Sly. Yeah, it's a good name for a Fox main character. Sly it is for five points apiece. All right, number seven. Shared last name of television siblings Simon and River, only seen for 14 episodes and a movie. Um, Jeff knew this one. It's Tam. Love Firefly. I believe Jeff knew this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil wrote a book. Did you come up with it as well? We did. We were focusing on Simon and River for too long, but then once we, we saw 14 episodes in a movie, trying to think of what shows only had that, and yeah, we said the same thing. We said Tam. Yeah, any opportunity to throw a Firefly reference in, I will take. Those are the siblings Simon and River Tam for five points apiece. Uh, number eight, and we'll start with Neil wrote a book. I needed the airport code for the second busiest airport in the U.S. in terms of passenger boardings in 2020, with over 18 million passengers served. Yeah, we think that Atlanta is number one and Houston might be number two, but we could not think of the call codes. But we do know that JFK is pretty busy, so we just said JFK. All right, afternoon, Ge Guinness. Geographically, I don't think you were far off with uh, Houston, um, but I believe it's Dallas-Fort Worth, DFW. Yeah, and that's five points to afternoon, Guinness. It surprised me as well when I did the research because I've always put uh, Chicago's O'Hare and Atlanta's airport is like one and two but apparently in 2020 dfw was the second most uh visited airport among passengers in the nation i believe atlanta is still number one uh number nine <laughs> substance that was added to schedule one of the controlled substances act in march of 2000 uh after guinness will give you the lead um we said ghb that's what it is yeah, we were so close. Uh, we, we were tapping around it, but we said RGH. Ah, yeah. No, GHB it is in five points this afternoon, Guinness. Uh, this came as an amendment uh, through a congressional act that was focusing on the use of illicit substances in uh, the dating industry to commit crime. And number 10, unit of typographical measure equal to half the point size of the typeface, such as eight points in a 16-point font. Uh, Neil wrote a book. Did you land this one? We did not. We said sub, S-U-B. So you may have noticed 
that we've gotten every other one right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that leaves us this one wrong. two letters, E and N. So we had uh, we had a lot of sweating going on here, figuring out which order those should go in. <laughs> we said N E. Fingers crossed. When you should have said E N. Oh mm. no! No. <laughs> and uh, another one of those two letter Scrabble words. You see a bunch. It. N pronounced as a letter N. It's literally the width of a character N in a typeset, uh, and it's half the size of an M dash in typography, which is based on the width of the letter M. Well, it looks like after the swing round, uh, Team Neil wrote a book. You should buy it. Uh, picked up 20, uh, 30 points, excuse me, bringing their total to 70. And uh, Afternoon Guinness picking up 45 points, bringing their total to 105 going into the second round. Well, you are in the driver's seat for the second half, Neil and Matt. That's the good news. Uh, we'll start with Neil. Same rules as the first half. Uh, go ahead and give me a pair of numbers from 1 to 10. First one will define the quiz from the World Trivia Federation. Second will define the question number uh, that we use. All right. I will double uh, my favorite number, and we're going to go 44. All right. Quiz four, question four. The category is business. While in relationship-seeking parlance, it can be used to mean big, beautiful woman, beautiful black woman, or a number of other phrases. On the New York Stock Exchange, the symbol BBW is used to represent what retail brand, founded by Maxine Clark in 1997, with approximately 300 stores in the U.S. and over 100 other locations internationally? I have a guess. I don't know. Okay, so they just locked in. Uh, we wrote down a bunch of names. I thought maybe it could be Lane Bryant uh, with Maxine Clark being sort of the founder of that company uh, and the BBW kind of fitting in. But Matt had a great guess too. Yeah, we started with W meaning potentially warehouse. Uh, and you said big box warehouse. 1997 is around the time we started seeing big lots around here. So we're going to say big lots. Um, I went completely off of BBW and I said Bath and Body Works. Oh, man, that's way more right. It is way more right, except that it isn't. Oh, good. Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, and I found this out through playtesting. The original methodology for this question was I was trying to find a company that had something you consider to be kind of a funny stock symbol. So I was looking through lists and I spotted BBW and I wanted to real I wanted people to realize that that doesn't really have anything to do with like the, the dating industry. Uh, when I had this run through my playtesters, so many of them said Bath and Body Works that I realized that this is a beautiful question for a very terrible reason, because there are two <laughs> well-known mall-based operations whose names could be abbreviated to BBW. One is Bath and Body Works, and the other, the correct answer, is Build-A-Bear Workshop. Oh. Oh. Yep, the name Maxine Clark found on every Build-A-Bear tag. Oh. You make your I, own best friend. I know I'd heard that name. Build-A-Bear workshop. And, get, and then you get their heart and you make a wish and then you put it in. We need to make so Triviality Build-A-Bears. Oh, there you go. Uh, Matt, we'll throw to you for a pair of numbers. Uh, we're going to go with uh, two and three. All right, quiz two, question three. The category is language. Introduced by Crayola in 1993 as a red-leaning shade of purple, what flashy-sounding color name, also found as the name of a liqueur produced by De Kuiper, is theoretically, but impossibly in practice, worth 48 points in U.S. Scrabble tile scoring due to its four instances of a certain high-value tile. My brain went to razzmatazz. Ooh. I like it. I just like it. I, I, I don't know anything else that makes any sense. I don't know. If Tickle Me Pink was the closest I got, and that was way <laughs> off, and you can't play it in Scrabble because it's more than one word. Uh, we'll tickle you pink after, after the recording. <laughs> You don't have to. It's plenty warm in here already. I'm turning pink. Um, Razzmatazz sounds awesome. So I would like to lock that in if you're good with it. Cool. Works for me. All right. Thanks, Liz. Great guess. Um, we we also were leaning at the Z being the four letters, but uh, we went with a much more simple pizzazz. Ooh. So when I ran this, uh, a couple players who know their colors a little more than I do guessed purple pizzazz, which fits so much of the clue, except for the part where purple pizzazz uh, didn't appear cool? in 1993. Correct answer is razzmatazz. And actually, uh, I take that back. Purple Pizzazz did also appear in 1993. It's not the name of a De Kuiper liqueur. Pick a number, Neil. 
Oh, uh, it's me. I'm going to go uh, with uh, the only starter on the Chicago Bears that I know will be great uh, this upcoming year after uh, a new sort of rebuild. And I'm going to say Roquan Smith's number, 58. All right, quiz five. Question eight. Category is film, because, of course, Neil gets a film question the ah. way Jeff picked the geography question. Uh, a certain cinematic team consists in part of members named Brian Fantana, Champ Kind, and Brick Tamland. What is the colorful name of the fourth primary member, which can be found in the subtitle of the first film in which this quartet of characters appears? We're good, Liz. Cool. Yeah. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> so you said Ron Burgundy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we wanted uh, to keep San Diego classy. Yeah. We said Ron Burgundy. See, not all of these questions are riddles wrapped in enigmas hidden in my BS. Uh, yeah, this is Ron Burgundy. From the Anchorman series. Well done to both teams on a quickie. Did you just throw a trident? <laughs> Brick killed a man. <laughs> uh, I got to go and rewatch that. Quickly. It's been a while. Um, I am next. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to go with number 10 and 8. All right. Category for this one is the arts. And I'm really glad as I read this that this was the set of people for this question because there is absolutely a connection here that I think you'll appreciate. The Chicken Ranch in a town called LaGrange inspired the titular setting of what musical that appeared on Broadway in 1978? The same establishment was the inspiration for a ZZ Top song named for the town released five years earlier, which borrowed its opening guitar part and a certain lyric from Ironically enough, the work of boogie blues legend John Lee Hooker. We can lock in over here. My brain wants it to be the music man, but I don't know. I don't think that's right. I don't know where Hooker comes in here. Um, Usually after you pay. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma was the first thing that came to mind, but I don't think it was in the 70s music man is a much better guess um i feel like hook is hooker a name of someone in oklahoma it could be tj i don't officer tj hooker thank you <laughs> excuse me uh <laughs> treat treat william shatner with respect um <laughs> <laughs> it could be i don't i don't know the musical well enough are you okay going with it i'm fine with it okay and if i'm wrong then i'll owe you 10 points uh <laughs> i don't know how i'll venmo that to you but we'll try <laughs> Well, uh, I love this question because uh, there was a reference to Dolly Parton earlier with 9 to 5, and Dolly Parton is a delight in the film version of the musical Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. So that's our answer. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you hear it, doesn't it? Uh, 10 points to Neil wrote a book. The Chicken Ranch was the name of a uh, an establishment referenced as the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. All right, so I believe we're back to Neil to pick for question five and a half. I'm going to go with uh, one of my favorite fictional film pitchers and a number that I wore when I played baseball, uh, Wild Thing, Ricky Vaughn, number 99. All right. Quiz nine, question nine. Category is technology. Used in three different contexts, what word can mean either a revolutionary means of converting energy into work, a revolutionary distribution service launched in 2003, or a revolutionary concept in education that serves to prepare students for the needs and demands of the 21st century. Well, as I'm 100% certain we could lock in. Oh, 100%. Yep, 100%. The only thing I, I'm hanging on to here is the revolutionary distribution service. So it's got to be 2003. I'm just trying to think of like, did Amazon start then? I don't think it It's way before then. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of distribution services. Facebook was 2003. No, it was it was like a program that was designed to get tech into kids' hands. Oh, right. Yeah. Like um like a not Millennium Project, but something like that. It was, yeah. It was... I thought you were saying like get tech into kids and it's like bionic children. Yeah. <laughs> bionic like children. Dare to keep the kids off drugs. Like we had a day um, sex about that. <laughs> it's not it's not is it like synergy? Uh, yeah, I, synergy that that could work. Synergize, yeah. Uh, the synergy of, I mean, that's better than anything I'm going to come up with because this one, I, I I know what what the question is asking. I just don't, I can't pull like the right terms. But yeah. synergy sounds good. It's, it's a it's a term, and it's you know. Yeah, let's go with synergy. Okay. 
Uh, Liz, my thought on this one is I experienced two of the three this morning. Uh, one when I made my tea, one when I was playing video games, and uh, I think it's Steam. Mm. And Steam it is. Ten points to afternoon Guinness. Uh, revolutionary means of converting energy to work, as in the development of the Industrial Revolution, starting off with the kickoff of the Steam Engine. Uh, revolutionary Distribution Service launched in 2003. That's when Valve put the Steam platform out, and it has really changed the way in which people uh, interact with video game developers economically. Uh, and the revolutionary concept in education, STEAM, the acronym, which stands for an emphasis on uh, education in science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. Mm. Great question. Thank you. That's STEM with some arts in it. Yes. Oh, you put some arts in my STEM. <laughs> That's on Matt's uh, profile. <laughs> so after five in the second round, it looks like uh, Neil wrote a book. You should buy it. It's called Being Patrick Swayze, Essential Teachings for the Master of Mold, available at all different bookstores, with uh, 20 points picking up there to 90 total. And uh, Afternoon Guinness picking up 30 more points, bringing their total to 135. Um, we're going to go with uh, round or game four, question seven. All right, quiz four, question seven. Category is science and nature. Oh, I'm bad at this. <laughs> the Bayou Tapestry is considered to be the first recorded visual depiction of what specific natural object whose existence has been known since at least the third century BCE, but didn't receive its current name until 1705. Some millennials may know what the object looks like outside of depictions, but nobody in Gen Z has ever directly seen it. I have a guess, but I want to chat about it. Yeah, I'd like to as well. I've got a couple ideas. So I wrote a question about the Bayou Tapestry ones. Was it uh, some sort of thing that was destroyed either by nature or some sort of like, I don't, wonder? I, all I know is that one time I wrote a question about <laughs> this, and I don't remember anything else, but the name sounded super familiar. And I don't think it's avocados. I know millennials love them, but Gen Z also likes them. All right, we cannot come up with a, a good answer. We both love fruit gushers, or at least we did before uh, the dentist told us to stop. So we're just going to lock in with uh, gusher. Liz, what were your thoughts? I was going to guess Hallie's Comet. I I like that because no one in Gen Z would have seen it. No because, one in Gen Z would have seen yeah. it. It came out in like eighty six. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it. So yeah, not I'm but and I'm so a millennial. Like, but <laughs> no, that's that's great. Yeah. I love it. That's a great great answer. All right, and the lead grows a little bit more for Afternoon Guinness. Uh, Haley's or Halley's Comet is the answer. There is a depiction of it on the Bayou Tapestry. Uh, didn't get its name until Edmund Halley uh, served as its namesake in 1705, and its last appearance in the night sky from Earth was in 1986, 1987, which means uh, elder millennials like myself may have seen it. Uh, nobody that was born after a certain year to be in Gen Z would have ever seen it directly. All right, back to Neil for question seven. Well, speaking of birth years, as you just said, I'm going to go with mine, and we're going to go with 85. All right, quiz eight, question five. Category was music. David St. Hubbins, Nigel Tufnell, and Derek Smalls are the canonical lead singer, guitarist, and bassist for what music act whose name is properly stylized with a dotless lowercase i and an umlaut over the letter n? Notably, no drummer is listed in this question, as the band has a disastrous history with percussionists. Yes, we're, we're locked in over here. Um, Liz, I'm pretty sure that this is Spinal Tap. Okay. Um, yeah, David St. Hubbins. Yeah, I, I definitely remember um, this one. I'm, that's why I was a little worried, though. Uh, Neil took a moment to, to lock in, so I was, I was kind of wondering if we were right, but I'm pretty sure we are. He also said this is Spinal Tap. Yeah, and this is, this is Spinal Tap, 10 points around. Uh, some of the causes of demise for their previous uh, drummers include such things as bizarre gardening accident, choking on uh, vomit, either their own or somebody else's, it's unclear, uh, spontaneous combustion, uh, explosion, jumping a shark tank on a tricycle, and being eaten by a pet python. Um, I feel like we haven't heard many questions from game one, so let's do game one, question three, lucky 13. All right, category on this one is history. According to the lyrics of a Union favorite song that was rewritten to later become the Battle Hymn of the Republic, what 
is the name of the controversial 19th century American whose body, quote, lies a moldering in the grave. Hell yeah. Uh, we can lock in. Love this question. What do you know about people in graves? Um, that you're not supposed to rob them. Correct. I don't know. I, I know the song, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, mm. I feel like I was just talking about it maybe on a, a game that's coming out soon, but I, I don't know whose grave was robbed. I, I think Ulysses S. Grant lived past the uh, beginning of the of the 20th century. Yeah. But do you want to just go Ulysses S. Grant? Let's do it. All right. All right. Um, so this one I'm pretty sure is, I don't um definitely known for a couple things, Bleeding Kansas and uh, his raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia. I believe this is John Brown's body who's a moldering in the grave. And his truth is marching on. John Brown is the correct answer there. Ten more points this afternoon, Guinness. You're right with the Civil War era, Neil. Oh, okay. Yeah. At least I was close. Yeah. Uh, number nine is going to go back to Neil to select. Oh, great. I, I don't know if we've had a, a game or a question, excuse me, from number three. Maybe we have, but I'm, I'm going to say 37. I already did that one. The answer is nylon. It sure is, okay. and you sure did. Let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say no on that. Okay. Uh, well, then we'll go. Um, we'll go with the the best uh, wingman uh, in Chicago history. We'll go thirty three. Thirty three category on this is science and nature. Anopheles is among the several genera of what specific living creature? With the said genus being particularly maligned for its exclusive connection to a specific malady that caused the deaths of an estimated six hundred and twenty seven thousand people in twenty twenty. While not malicious, the creature is nevertheless, nevertheless in a maleficial symbiotic relationship with other such species as humans. I think I think um, I got this one, but okay, I think I know it too. But I'm happy oh, to go with what you I'll, have. You can you can read it off. I trust you. Yeah, All right, we're we're unfortunately we're going to go with the uh, the famed uh, barbecue sauce uh, promoted by Julia Stiles after the release of the film Mesquite O. I. Don't think you had to say it like that, but I would agree. I think it's the mosquito. Yeah, uh, that would be the creature uh, maligned for the malady that's not malicious, but is malefical, and that is malaria. Uh, mosquito is the living creature we needed here. I just wanted to see in the writing of this if I could find four words that also start with the same prefix as malaria to give you that subconscious uh, nudge in the right direction. And it seems to have worked. All right, the question 10 to end the second half. Uh, Matt, take it away with a pick. Uh, the last one, let's go with game 10, question 10. Why not? You got it. Uh, category on this is language. A certain English word, which means a particular body part or slangily some money, is false friends with a French word often experienced after enjoying a work of international cinema. What is that word? Do, uh, I don't know if we should just lock in with your answer. It is a body part and slang term for money. Okay. Let's end uh, the, the regulation on a low note and just lock in with what you have. Maybe we'll be lucky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think we can just uh, say something stupid and lock in. <laughs> sure. We already locked in. Do we in, have so. even a guess? Sure. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, they got nothing. Um, we got nothing. They can body parts, money. I don't know if we have any skin in the game, so we just said skin. I want to let you know this, I believe, was the hardest question uh, to date that the World Trivia Federation has seen. 15% of respondents were able to get it. Uh, the answer here is thin. Yep. Oh, As in a body part yeah. found uh, notably on fish. Uh, slang for a $5 bill is a fin and false friends yeah, in this fin. case just means two words uh, in two different languages that look and sound the same but come from completely different origins and have completely different meanings. And if you're experiencing a work of international cinema, the uh, final thing you see on screen might be the French word fin. I, uh, I would like to say how poetically resonant it is that we're saying fin at the end of regulation. It is the end of regulation on a great question uh, from Jay there. And it looks like uh, Team Neil wrote a book is only going to pick up 20 more points, bringing their total of 110 to wager with. And Afternoon Guinness, almost perfect in the second half of the round, picking up 40 more points, bringing their total to 175. And if I remember, 
at the beginning of the game, one of the coolest things that's happened on this show. Jay has been writing questions uh, for the categories of Disney, Magic, Spielberg, Greed, and Ocarina. Is that correct, Jay? That is correct. Those questions are written. I didn't know what they were going to be when we started this, uh, but they've been written and polished a little bit while you all were thinking through some of the other questions. Uh, I'm ready to go into the final round if you are. All right. All the wagers are locked in. And just to note one more time just how incredible it is uh, what Jay has done. Uh, she wrote uh, five final questions uh, during the game while we were playing. So uh, we're going to throw it over to Jay and you can take it away. All right. So thank you so much for that praise uh, in advance, which is the best way to praise my content. Uh, question one in the final round, the category suggested was by Liz and it is Disney. Disney Cruise Line features two classes of ship in service as of the end of 2021, the Magic and Dream class of ships. A third line, which is set to join the fleet in 2022, includes the Disney Wish cruise ship and is named fittingly for what character? No word on if this ship will set sail from South Padre Island or not. All right, this was Jeff's suggestion. The category or keyword was magic. The word magic appears exactly two times in the list of every U.S. Billboard Hot 100 number one song to date. Name both the number one song by a group named Magic and the artist behind a number one song titled Magic. Number three, this was Neil's suggestion. The category is Spielberg. As a last name, Spielberg is derived from the German for what word? which features in the plural as the title of a 2009 film directed by Zack Snyder, not Steven Spielberg. Number four, Matt asked for a question about greed. Greed was the title of a short-lived big money game show that aired on Fox from 1999 to 2000, hosted by what well-known name in game shows, who has been fairly criticized in recent years for a number of tweets that among other things, claimed that the CDC, Democratic Party, media, and medical industry were lying about the COVID pandemic, which was retweeted by Donald Trump back when he could, you know, retweet. And number five, uh, Ken mailed in the suggestion of a keyword of ocarina. The Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time, is frequently ranked in the top echelon of greatest video games of all time, according to critics and publications. But conversely, the game Zelda The Wand of Gamelon has been named one of the 10 worst video games ever created by multiple reviewers, mostly because it really sucks. This game was released in 1993 for what unsuccessful console produced by the Dutch tech company Philips? Okay, we're going to go over these questions and be back with our answers. Okay, all the answers have now been locked in. We're going to go through the questions one more time, give our answers, and see how this game is going to turn out. All right, question one. The category was Disney on behalf of Liz's suggestion. Uh, Disney Cruise Line features two classes of ship in service as of the end of 2021, the Magic and Dream class of ships. A third line, which is set to join the fleet in 2022, includes the Disney Wish cruise ship and is named fittingly for what character? No word on if this ship will set sail from South Padre Island or not. Um, we guessed Jiminy Cricket. Uh, wager on that was 30. Mm. Okay. And Matt and Neil, what did you throw down? We uh, we wagered 20 points on this one, and we were between Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket, and we went uh, Pinocchio. Ah, all right. So unfortunately, both teams will be losing their wagers on this one. There were a pair of very subtle clues in this. Uh, the first is the fittingly in reference to a cruise ship, because I wanted you to start thinking about uh, Disney films that are connected with the water. Uh, and the other one was the throwaway reference to South Padre Island, Padre being the Spanish for father. Uh, it is the Triton class of ship. Mm. Ah, okay. I just saw a commercial for this, and I could not think of the name. Like, it, they're already airing commercials for it. So. They're in your algorithm, as Disney yeah. often is. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that one went off like a lead balloon. Number two was Jeff's uh, requested category, Magic. Uh, question again. The word magic appears exactly two times in the list of every U.S. Billboard Hot 100 number one song to date. I need you to name both the number one song by a group named Magic and the artist behind a number one song titled Magic. Uh, we'll start with Neil and Matt. 
Uh, we wagered 25 and did not have a lot of ideas. Uh, I got Magic Carpet Ride. That's what we were thinking of the whole time, which is Steve Miller Band, I believe. No, I'm wrong. And we, we knew Red Dress by Magic, which is like a number one hit, but we couldn't get both of them. Yeah, so we had nothing. And that's not even right. It's actually Rude, I believe. Oh, is that the name of the band? Why gotta be so that's rude? the name of the song. Oh, oh, Rude. Oh, okay. I'm going to marry her anyway. Yeah. Yeah, Liz, uh, we had 10 points on this one. What did we say? This was mostly you. Uh, Rune and I, I think it's B.O.B., but I could be wrong with the magic song. I get them all confused. No, you're right in as much as B.O.B. has a hit song titled Magic Liz that peaked at number 10 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. Uh, Rude is the name of the song that hit number one for uh, 2010's group Magic. Uh, you've got to go all the way back to 1980 to find a song that hit number one titled Magic. Uh, and that was recorded by Olivia Newton-John. Ah, okay. So auspicious start to this final round. Let's move into number three. Uh, Neil wanted a question that has to do with Spielberg. Uh, so I gave you one. Uh, as a last name, Spielberg is derived from the German for what word, which features in the plural as the title of a 2009 film directed by Zack Snyder, not Steven Spielberg. Uh, figure we'll let Liz and Jeff take the lead. Okay, we had uh, 10 points on this one, and when I used to think of Zack Snyder movies that were way too long, I used to think of Watchmen. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, I know a lot of things about Spielberg, didn't know about the name Origins, but I knew Zack Snyder uh, directed a movie called Watchmen, so the non-plural version would be Watchman. So that's what we like. Yep, with. Watchman it is for, t uh, for your wagers of peace. Spielberg is the German word for the job description Watchman. All right. Mm, all right. And if I had had more time, there would have been a reference to Sony in there. There would have been a reference to uh, go set a Watchman in there. But this was speed written. So you get Neil having to answer a question that is explicitly not about Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, love it. Uh, number four, Matt wanted a question to do with Greed. Here it is. Greed was the title of a short-lived big money game show that aired on Fox from 1999 to 2000, hosted by what well-known name in game shows, who's been fairly criticized in recent years for a number of tweets that, among other things, claimed that the CDC, Democratic Party, media, and medical industry were lying about the COVID pandemic, which was retweeted by Donald Trump back when he could, you know, retweet. Uh, Matt, this word salad was your fault, so we'll let you go first. Yeah, it's the, it only lasted a year, so I'm guessing greed was not good um, in this sense. But uh, I think this was after he was giving away his own money, and we went with Ben Stein. For 20 points. Uh, we put 10 on the line, Liz, and I think you pulled this one. Uh, we said Chuck Woolery. Yeah, Chuck Woolery sucks and is correct. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, he's had a number of uh, politically charged and controversial uh, tweets over the last several years. So it's I used to love Chuck Woolery as a game show host, uh, you know, back in my childhood. I would watch Love Connection for no good reason. Uh, yeah, I believe he was the host of Scrabble as well. Uh, and then, you know, Greed, I actually thought was a really good show for the season or two it was on. Uh, and now I'm just I'm happy I live in a world where I don't follow Chuck Woolery on Twitter. Well, apologies to Ben Stein, who I'm sure is tweeting delightful things about dry red eyes. Uh, and number five, Ken, who didn't even bother to show up for the recording, still sent a suggestion on the category of Ocarina. Uh, here's the question again. The Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time, is frequently ranked in the top echelon of greatest video games of all time, according to critics and publications. But conversely, the game Zelda The Wand of Gamelon has been named one of the 10 worst video games ever created by multiple reviewers, mostly because it really sucks. Uh, this game was released in 1993 for what unsuccessful console produced by the Dutch tech company Philips? Yeah, we wagered 20. Uh, this was on a system where they also released, I believe, Mario's Hotel. And after these two bombs, Nintendo said no one else is making games with our properties again. Uh, this was the Philips CDI. Oh. Yeah, um, we wagered 10, which means we're going to be losing 10. Um, and we just went with uh, everyone slash Neil's favorite, Atari Jaguar. Jaguar. Uh, yes, the Philips console, the Atari Jaguar. Uh, 20 <laughs> points going to Neil wrote a book on this one. It is the Philips CDI, and it had a lot of promise being uh, one of the earliest CD-ROM driven home gaming consoles. The problem is they kept uh, putting out games like Zelda, the one of Gamelon, which after mm -hmm. the episode, if you want to just take a look at some of the graphical stills from this thing, it is nightmare fuel. Very bad. 
So if my math serves me correct, which it often does not, I believe uh, Team Neil wrote a book, and you should buy it. It's called Being Patrick Swayze, Essential Teachings from the Master of the Mullet, a comedic love letter of Patrick Swayze's life and career, available at all of your favorite bookstores. By uh, Neely Fisher, author, podcaster, director. Loser of game. Loser of game uh, <laughs> is minus 15 points for us over here, so I, we're going to end with 95, but today's cream of the crop, only losing 30 points in the final round, <laughs> is Afternoon Guinness with 145 points. The cream of the crop. Great well game. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for... Uh, joining me and uh pulling out this nice victory today i feel like it was a nice team effort it was liz said uh, you know i only know disney stuff and turns out that's not even close to true um because <laughs> she knew a lot of other stuff so yeah you helped your team win liz and uh you know the floor is yours any shout outs anyone you'd like to say hello to we know that uh, you work a very secretive job so we don't want to give any code names out but who would you like to, to say hello to oh i don't know um it's like one of those things when people ask you to like tell them about yourself and you panic. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know there would be this part. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Shout out to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. There you Why go. Not? He yeah. needs more credit. Yeah, exactly. Well, Liz. <laughs> he's very charming. He, he is very charming. And hopefully uh, he'll listen to this and maybe um, he'll come become on. Become a patron. <laughs> yeah, become a patron. Uh, he's got money. Come on. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today, though. We had a blast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Uh, well, thank you for joining us and for being a Patreon supporter. And Jay, uh, what a wonderful game that you've written uh, with some great uh, just, you know, muscle flexing there at the end. Well, of the I think round. what we learned is that the longer you spend on your questions, the easier they get, because right after you write them, they're very difficult. You know, what, sometimes, but... yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> where, where can all of our listeners uh, find WTF and join in on the fun? All right. So the World Trivia Federation is available to anybody on uh, the Liquid Courage Patreon, patreon.com slash liquid courage. That is courage with a K. Uh, for a donation every month of at least $2, you get full access. It is not tiered. It is a, a binary in out situation. Um, and that provides you currently two 10 question quizzes a week to be done kind of at your own speed, at your own uh, leisure, 36 hours to submit your answers. Uh, and we'll be increasing that sometime later this year to three quizzes a week, releasing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, outside of the WTF, you can find my content in the Chicagoland area at a bar uh, near you. Hopefully, if you go and tell that bar to book Liquid Courage. Uh, and if you don't, you can stay and watch my content from the comfort of your own home on Twitch at twitch.tv slash liquid underscore courage. Because believe it or not, somebody already had the name. With a K? Yeah, with a K. Weird. Wow. Uh, <laughs> but they probably didn't pronounce it Courage. Well, nobody like pronounces we have... it Courage, Neil. Nobody <laughs> pronounces it Courage. <laughs> Well, uh, we we appreciate you uh, being here and, uh, you know, giving, giving us your yearly visit uh, and just uh, being a, a great friend. So thank you very much for joining us today, Jay. Uh, it's sincere pleasure, as always, to be here. I can't believe I think this is my eighth appearance on the show at this point. Mm. So we're almost at 10. Uh, yeah, get almost get more patrons. That I way I don't done. have to keep coming back. Yeah, that's true. Yes. <laughs> join, join us at patreon.com slash triviality podcast, just like Jay and Liz. And uh, since Jay uh, is coming on for a yearly checkup uh, in order to stay in good health like Jay, eat your vitamins, play your trivia, and listen to Triviality for uh, for Matt, Jeff, Liz, Jay, and Ken, uh, who is out uh, creating his own new company. My name is Neil, and that was Triviality. That's not a, a treat, though. That's a treat dispensary. Oh, treat dispensary, right. <laughs> Which would be a much better song. I'll, yeah. I'll take you to the treat dispensary. Uh, well, that's fine. We can, we can go with yours, yeah. <laughs> Get Richard Die Trying did come out in like 2003 for the record. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you could, you could let you let you lick a lollipop at the treat dispensary. <laughs> Treat dispensary. <laughs> that would have been a much better yeah. 50 cent song. Oh, uh, when he's hanging upside down at the Super Bowl, if that's what he was singing. Um, I think that we, we're going to lock in with this wrong answer. <laughs>